Delray Beach, Florida. Vibrant, full of life in every aspect of the city's 15 square miles, from its alluring beach to the westernmost edges of town. Twice named an All-America City, a flourishing business district, and a charm lifestyle enjoyed not only by Delray's more than 60,000 residents, but also thousands of visitors who converge on the seaside town each year. While newcomers and visitors marvel at the city regarded as a jewel in southern Palm Beach County, it is no surprise to the descendants of Delray's first settlers. The city of Delray Beach has a very rich history of diverse cultures. However, a significant portion of that history has been either omitted or ignored by most historians. Only a few historians give accounts that show the first inhabitants of South Florida, including in the area that is now known as Delray Beach, were Seminole Indians and Blacks. The first settlements of Delray Beach were Seminole and Black communities, each with its own distinct culture and each made very significant contributions to shaping what Delray Beach is today. Decades before the start of the Civil War, blacks escaped slavery and fled the United States, taking refuge in Spanish Florida. In fact, according to historical accounts, blacks and Seminole Indians had already established settlements in Florida some 100 years before the end of slavery. Even as early as 1668, blacks started coming into the state of Florida when Florida was under the Spanish rule. They were runaway slaves basically out of the South Carolina and Georgia states. And they were coming down here because it was a different acceptance and a different way that the Spanish ruled this colony as against the British. So blacks came down in, at, at a time and because also there were Native Americans who were also runaways, uh, Seminole Indians, which is runaway, which means runaway, but they were com coming out of uh, Alabama, Creeks, and they were coming to the same area and they had been here for a while. So blacks came into this area long before um, the, the Civil War. In that they were one of the first persons to inhabit this uh, part of the state, they understand how to live here, though better than the newcomers. They, under, they understood and had found ways in which to uh, cultivate the land. They found ways in which to control the insects and they just knew just a little bit more than the, the newcomers how to live in this part of the, uh, in this part of the country. After slavery ended, uh, they found uh, African Americans in the northern part of Florida and the uh, Bahamas came here because there was more work. They, they could live freely. And uh, it was some time after slavery uh, was abolished that they realized it. When they came to Delray Beach, they found living here Seminole Indians and they intermingled and they even married. So the, a white man found living here, Negroes, Seminole Indians, and Seminole Negroes. Near the end of the 19th century, oil magnate Henry Flagler began building the railroad from Jacksonville to Key West, igniting a land boom and drawing more blacks to South Florida. Black migrants converged on South Florida, including Delray from the Bahamas, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, and North Florida's Panhandle. By the early 20th century, blacks had settled in an area known as Colored Town and gradually developed distinct sub-communities. So the area was split into three uh, sections. And of course, if you go count Newtown, there was a fourth section. But we had what was known as uh, Frog Alley, we had uh, the red line, uh, we had the sands, and we had the inner, inner city. In most cases, when you talk about quarters, it usually has a name. 
And that name then may have been derived from either the, the owner or the quarters, or something like the red line, some, some distinguishing characteristic of the place. Uh, the red line was, uh, was uh, one of the quarters. And again, the quarters then being those, those uh, more or less confined communities uh, of, of, of workers or, or, or that community. And they say, well, all the roofs were painted red. You know, so we had then these quarters had a distinguishing characteristic as being red, red roofs, and it's called the red line. And we must remember, too, that they needed to have these names. These names were very important because they were the addresses of people. Anybody who came to town, uh, do you know where Mr. Giles lived? Who? The Giles family. Oh, they lived down, they didn't have a street. So they lived down in Frog Alley. So you go down in Frog Alley and everybody knew everybody. And if, if for a while, everybody knew, if you, they, they didn't know you, they know who to associate you with. The Sands, the first of the sub-communities developed, was located north of Atlantic Avenue and west of Swinton Avenue. For a period of time, the Sands extended north of Lake Ida Road, but later the homes of black families were moved south and a wall was erected separating white neighborhoods from the black community of the Sands. The Sands consisted of even smaller communities such as Hannatown. And there was a gentleman from uh, the Bahamas, it's called Pa Hanna. He settled in a two block area in the Sands area but because there were so many members of his family, that part of the Sands was given another name, Hannatown, because of him. The Sands was any area in the black community that was north of 2nd Street that was considered the Sands. Why well, I was going to say the Sands? Because there were no hard service roads in that area at all. And the only thing out there was the, the white uh, sand and it was difficult to build homes up there because there was no solid foundation. Especially up in Hannatown, it was white sand, a lot of white sand, but we were, we were most like on dark, dark soil, you know. Yeah, right there now, because we in Hannatown now, I guess you wouldn't know it now because houses are built and things like that, and the sand was white. The blacks who settled in the sands, with the exception of those in Hannatown, migrated from North Florida and other southern states. Many other blacks arrived from the Bahamas and made their home south of Atlantic Avenue. Because of the very distinguishing geographical characteristics in the area south of Atlantic Avenue and its environment, it became known to everyone as Frog Alley. Well, Frog Alley was a different area and it was kind of wet and soggy most of the time. And the reason why it got its name Frog Alley is because during the rainy season, a lot of water settled in that area and, and of course, you know, we black people in our culture, we, we, we find nicknames for whatever it is to fit the purpose. And, and, and usually a nickname describes the kind of situation or the type of person. But Frog Alley was, was a, a, a low dwelling part of Delray Beach where water uh, settled and where the frogs and the snakes and those things. And in the evening time, you could hear nothing but the frogs croaking all evening long. And so that's how it got its name. Throughout the years, Delray developed into a very culturally diverse community of predominantly blacks, whites, and Native Americans. In the black communities, people shared a common ancestry, but they were also mindful of their different nationalities and cultures. And while they all lived among each other harmoniously, each group commonly perceived itself to be of higher esteem than the other. In Frog Alley, mostly the people from Nassau lived there. And after you cross Atlantic Avenue and north, most of the people in that area came from Georgia, North Carolina, and places like that. So they were kind of divided, because uh, the children from, from uh, north of Atlantic 
we didn't associate with them too much, and they didn't associate with us too much. And we had something like, you know, uh, we are the boss down here and you're the boss up there. <laughs> but we all had a good time. The people from the Bahamas were called Nassau's, and the people from North Florida and Carolinas, they were Americans. So they had a little bit of that among them too. A, a, you, a, a person from, the, Mar from uh, the Bahamas to marry a man from North Florida, what did she see in them? You know, the American people, they ain't no good. You know, that sort of thing. And vice versa. A person from here, they wouldn't think of marrying a person from the Bahamas because they, they thought they were lower in character than the other. Many of the the northern blacks came because some of them were runaway slaves and some were looking for a better way of life. The people from the Bahamas came because they were looking for a better place of life. The, the Geeches from, from the Carolinas came. And as a result, they were, even though we all were black, we all came with different cultures and different mixtures. And early on, most of them with their various cultures stuck together and, and they perpetuated the, 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 the family life that they had early on. The difference in nationalities and cultures and the, also extended to a difference in religious yeah. faiths. Now, the Episcopal Church served most of the community in Frog Alley who was Bahamians. And the people who were in Frog Alley who were not Bahamians came up here to church, to Mount Olive, uh, the AME, and uh, the, the Primitive Baptist Church. But each one had their own culture and each one had a little social set. And each one kind of stuck together. In uh, Frog Alley, I was a member of the Episcopal Church, and uh, they used to have what they called a curry. It was <laughs> ever so often. And uh, the other churches didn't have that. And uh, say on weekends, Christmas and holidays, they used to have the curry. And over in the uh, 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 the church recreation department, it was all from the church. And they were dancing all night and all that, almost, and have a good time. But other churches didn't have that. But the Episcopal Church did. I was in, in, in Mount Olive at that time. And uh, they would have for the young people like, like Sunday school in the mornings, and then the worship service. And then later on in the evening, they would have a call, young people being called BYP, Baptist Young People Training Union. And we would go out and have a, have a singing and, and little plays and things. Uh, and so we just got a kick out of it, you know. Regardless of faith, the church was an integral part of both the Sands and Frog Alley communities. The church served as more than a place of worship. It was and is the cornerstone of black civic and political leadership in Delray, as it was and is in black communities throughout America. Uh, you do always hear the ministers and the old elders in the church talking about what was going on, especially when we came up to able to vote. And, uh, uh, you know, they always talked about what should or should not be. We did look to them for guidance. As Delray's black population grew, so did church activities in both communities, and through those church activities, as well as school activities, a gradual blending of cultures began to take place. In the later years, before the war, we got with everybody with different life. You were associating much different with each other. You were learning more about each other. Different schools were much better associating with, with other schools. So then we got along real good. As we grew together, we found out that we had more in common than, than we had differences. And as a result, we pooled together to make this new home in Delray Beach a place for all of us to live. And therefore, we had schools where we, we met together, our churches where we met together, and eventually the churches themselves became integrated. And, 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 and when that happened, we had preachers talking to one another about their congregations and what we, could we do to make life better for each one of the citizens. 
Mount Olive Baptist was the first church built in Delray. Some church congregations didn't have a building at all, but that didn't stop them from having church meetings. Roy Simon recalls the campfire meetings black church groups held in open fields when he was a young boy. As I recall, uh, we, they were mostly in the evenings or at night, and just about my bedtime, so I'd lie in bed and I'd hear these sounds, and it sounded... You'd hear a, a drum beat, or whether it was hitting moist tubs or something like that, uh, loud banging noises and, and uh, loud yelling or screaming. Uh, I, pres I was told they were revival type or uh, holy rollers, I think is what they called them back then. Some people uh, had a quiet style, like my grandparents. They came from the Bahamas. They, in the Bahamas, were members of the Church of England, like the Episcopal Church, pretty much. So they grouped themselves together. They didn't have a building, per se. Mount Olive Baptist Church was the first building, so then they had to have meetings in various other uh, uh, parts, you know. Some of them kept, had uh, uh, church services in their homes and others just opted to because of various reasons maybe the homes weren't large enough they just went out in the field or the park or just outdoors had services outdoors as the churches grew the communities began to blend more and more participating in each other's church activities even sharing church facilities the, even though they shared uh, mount olive baptist church they alternated sundays one Sunday, the Methodists would have occupied the church and have services. The next Sunday, the Baptists would occupy the church and have services. So you see, even though they were separate, in, in many ways, in that way anyway, they were together. Oh my goodness, like I said before, like one church had the revival, everybody, all the other churches would go to that revival. And then when, each, each, each church, there wouldn't be two revivals at the same time. And so they were, they were singing and shouting. <laughs> the lifestyles of the residents in the Sands and in Frog Alley was very much reflected in the type of houses in which they lived. In most cases, the extended family played an important role in the family unit, and the type of house supported that role. The extended family, as far as blood relatives were concerned, plus the families who were just friends who were in the neighborhood. Uh, my neighborhood, I guess you could feel like me and all of the other children were very protected. I had an older grand aunt and uncle who lived two of those from us. My grandmother was next door. And then my uncle and his wife, who were younger, you know, with, uh, who were on the next street right behind us. Then uh, there was the uh, Bahamian family right next door who had children my age. They had been there like my parents had been. And uh, so we all lived, uh, lived, you know, just like family. A very common type of house, both in Frog Alley and in the Sands, was the so-called shotgun house, a very narrow but long dwelling with rooms that lined up one behind the other and a clear view through the entire house from the front door to the back. The lifestyle at the time was very much about that. It had to do with, um, with efficiency and the use of space. You, didn't have, you couldn't afford a lot of space. And there wasn't a lot of space, particularly in, in the black communities that you could, you know, you could use. So you, find, you would find places there were, we call them quarters, we call them quarters, and I suppose then too, where you had these small communities of small vernacular wood frame houses. Uh, so there then I think you know, produced kind of a lifestyle uh, part of it, and you would say that produced cult, uh, the community, you know, a community of, say, Frog Alley or a community of the Sands. Uh, so, so we, we, we sort of developed our, our, our communities around that kind of a lifestyle and the, the built environment actually reflected on it as well. Well, primarily there were one or two room houses, yes. yes. Um, initially that's about all you could do. There was a shortage, you know, material 
And uh, those lots out there were in 15 or 20 foot, 5 foot widths. So you couldn't do much more than a shotgun. One such neighborhood that consisted of shotgun houses was Simon Quarters, called, named uh, after Roy uh, Simon's uh, grandfather, uh, who built the houses specifically sure for black right. families. Uh, when there was a lot of farming west of Del Rey, and they were bringing in, uh, using migrant workers from Georgia and the Carolinas. And they came down, it was primarily a winter season thing. And that part, a very wet community west of the of Swinton Avenue, that led right into the glades. And apparently um, the city fathers felt that the hygiene and the living conditions intense that the migrants were subject to. Uh, they wanted to give them a little more permanent housing. I think they even had some fire problems. Uh, and I think my fa grandfather, among other men, were approached by the city to see if they would uh, build these quarters. So I guess the Simon quarters were those that he built. We had several shotgun uh, houses in Frog Alley. Up on the north end of town, Mr. Flagler built a uh, row of short, shotgun houses on Northwest 3rd Avenue. And uh, they call that the red line because he painted the roof of each one of those houses red. So that was called the red line. And I think he had about four or five common uh, outhouses in the back that they shared. The other thing too is that uh, the, these units sometimes were actually moved with the people. So you could actually move your house with you very easily to, to be done. Uh, and during the early stages when, uh, I guess when the railroad, Flagler's Railroad was actually being built, uh, they brought in many of these, these units for, for the workers, so it was actually moved around and they could move with them as well. In most cases, the front porch was, all, was generally referred to as the living room, and the living room being the fact that you were out there all the time. Uh, it was a, a place for socialization uh, because everyone passed down the street, you know, and you had you know to speak to your neighbor. It, it was a great it was a great uh, uh, opportunity for for community development and community building because you could say hey, but every, everybody sees everybody there, and and everyone knew that you were there. And they kept it decorated very nice. That uh, I mean with flowers and plants and whatnot. And of course they had the rocking chairs there. And a lot of people that came to visit, that's where they visited. They'd knock on the door and the owner or the homeowner came to the door and they sat on the porch and they visited. Sign of a well-kept house was a well-swept front yard with flowers and plants. They literally swept the yard with the old broom to make it look nice. And they, anybody that passed the house, a house like that, they knew that there was some good livers, so they took well care of the house on the inside. The, the fact that they were built up on these piers, or if they were built up on a tree stump, or in some cases just a, a stone, some, uh, four stones, uh, or brick, uh, this, this was important not only for, for uh, the event of, of rain or heavy waters, but also for ventilation, because the, the place was, was cool. Uh, underneath there, you have this, uh, it was always cool under there. And, and that then uh, allowed for the, the, the interiors to be somewhat cool as well. Uh, the other thing about it too is that there was a great um, uh, air, uh, cross ventilation. And you know, we were talking about whether or not the shotguns had windows or not. Um, in some cases, they, they would. Um, in some cases, if they were too close together in some of the quarters, uh, they may not have been to get the air through, otherwise you'd, you'd suffocate nothing. Uh, you wouldn't, you see the buildings you see today with, we didn't have air conditioning in Florida. Uh, so the shotgun houses were probably help, helpful from a design point of view for just uh, uh, circulation of air. The shotgun wasn't the only type of house in Delray's early black communities. Black families who could afford larger dwellings lived in bungalow, Bahamian, and mission-style homes.
Farming was the chief livelihood in early Delray, especially for black families. A few blacks had their own farms, but most worked as bean pickers on the larger white farms, which shipped fresh produce to the north via railroad. The railroad played a great part. At when the after the railroad came through, they had a larger they had larger farms because they had a means by where they could ship their crop to various parts of the country. Each family had a kitchen garden, I should say, that was tended by the housewife or the housekeeper, whomever that person was. But the man of the house went out farther in the area and made, uh, had larger farms uh, whereby they could ship their crops by train to various parts of the country. School wasn't open. Uh, during the winter months when the farmers were gathering their crops. And a lot of kids were out on the glades with their uh, parents. And a lot of kids got drowned out on the glades. As Henry Flagler developed South Florida's coastline, more white families began moving into Delray and other nearby areas. These new arrivals provided opportunities for blacks to temporarily leave the bean fields for a different type of work. Most of us uh, got jobs over on the beach as maids and chauffeurs and domestic workers. And uh, much of our skills and our knowledge and our experience was taught from our association with, with, with the rich whites who came down for those three or four months out of the year. But when they were not here and we were not working as domestic workers, most of us was farmers, bean pickers, and gladiator farmers and pineapple growers and those kinds. And we did a lot of fishing. One of the places where blacks found domestic work was at the Kentucky House, a rooming house built on Atlantic Avenue near the Intracoastal Waterway in the early 1900s. The Kentucky House was owned and operated by the grandfather of Dwight Bradshaw. My granddad came in 1911 and he, he bought a rooming house on the corner, on the northwest corner of Atlantic Avenue and uh, the Intracoastal. And then he went back up to LaGrange, Kentucky and got the family together and put all the furniture and the cows and chickens and everything into three boxcars. And they came to Del Rey in 1912 and uh, set the rooming house up and called it the Kentucky House. It's, it's a hotel, set it up as a hotel. So all the, the help was African American. They were the people from Del Rey, uh, from the western part of Del Rey, and uh, there was a lot of them, and I, I knew some of them that afterwards, after the Kentucky house was gone, they knew me and I knew them, and we were friends, and uh, I remember Willie was one, Rice was another, I think they were waiters in the Kentucky house. And, uh, and then the 1928 hurricane, the, they had, they, everybody came and stayed at the Kentucky house and there weren't enough beds to go around. And so they spent the hurricane and all sitting on the stairwell on the stairs of the Kentucky house. In 1925, Delray was incorporated as Delray Beach after first being incorporated as Delray in 1911. Life remained constant in Delray throughout the 1920s up until 1929, when lifestyles took a drastic turn for citizens in Delray Beach and people throughout the world. Oh my goodness, it had an effect on everybody. My father had lost everything, you know, and then the farm had gone bad. And um, really, it was hard for us to eat because I remember we had guava trees out there <laughs> and my little nephew, um, he um, went up in a guava tree and I said, I said, we called him Sonny. I said, Sonny, what are you? I said, what, what are you doing eating those, those green guavas? He said, he looked down at me, he said, cause I'm hungry. <laughs> and, and, 
It was the Great Depression that cost S.C. Robinson's father his farm. To make matters worse, despite warnings the bank was about to fail, Robinson lost all of the money he had just received from the sale of some of his land. My father, he didn't, he didn't get the news directly, but he got it through my mother because somebody told my aunt, which is his sister, and other people, and then my mother got hold of the news from some source, and she told him, and so he didn't think it was anything, it was possible that anything like that to happen. A bank go broke, <laughs> and he called my mother a fool. He said, you, 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 you a fool. <laughs> I'll never will forget that. <laughs> and so when, when it happened, he had, he had just come from the field, and um, he came in the living room, and, um, and um, he, he had washed up and everything. My mother wouldn't tell him uh, right away. So he sat on the piano stool, and um, my mother told him she had something to say, and say, well, this happened. The bank's going broke. And as I told you before, I'll never forget that look until my dying day on his face. The Depression affected different families in the Sands and in Frog Alley in different ways. While some families were devastated, others hardly noticed any difference at all. Due to the way the blacks were living during that, they didn't have very much anyway. So it didn't affect them too much because they were used to not having very much, you know. So, so they got along pretty good. But uh, they didn't get very much for their work and all that. So they, they uh, knew how to sacrifice and how to, to uh, get themselves to realize, well, we haven't got very much anyway. So they knew that, well, it doesn't affect us because we were this way all the time, you know. During Depression time, things were so bad, uh, and me and my sister, I was, I was big enough to go and pick beans. We went pick beans for the Caucasian farmers too. And, um, and then when we got paid, um, each one of us would come and um, give my father, uh, give, we'd give my mother so much money. It was a round table, that table in there was a, was a round table in the dining room, that's where we all sat around the table and ate. And they would be sitting to the table and um, my father had so much pride, he said, gee, I never thought I would live, live to see my children have to come and give me the money. During the Great Depression, the people of the Sands and Frog Alley demonstrated a kind of resilience black communities typically show during hard times. The Depression undoubtedly reshaped the communities in one form or another, but that paled in comparison to how an event halfway around the world would change their lifestyles, even the geographical dimensions of Delray's black community. brought the beginning of World War II, a conflict that escalated in the 1940s. Because of the war, the U.S. government acquired an important swath of property in Boca Raton known as Yamato, a Japanese settlement. The government's acquisition of Yamato would change life in Delray Beach forever. The United States government was looking around for a site here in uh, southern Florida on which to establish an Army Air Corps training facility of some kind. And they had a few sites in mind. One was the Yamato area, uh, but there were others as well. Uh, Vero Beach uh, was a prospect. Um, the government uh, decided upon the Yamato area, uh, possibly because uh, so much of the farmland or uh, quite, uh, some of the farmland in the area was owned by Japanese and they would be uh, um, fairly easy to, uh, to remove uh, from the uh, from, from the property because of uh, uh, you know, the general uh, attitude towards Japanese at the time, since we were at war with uh, the country of Japan. The situation in, uh, in Boca Raton caused several things to occur. Number one, it established a new area in Delray Beach called Newtown. Uh, it was uh, Newtown because many of the families who lived in Boca Raton had to be displaced so that they would have room to build and construct the new air base that was going to be uh, 
hell and train troops or train Air Force personnel down in Boca Raton. The government wanted to take that land because it was too near to where the, uh, the uh, Army Air Base was going to be. So the federal government uh, had these people uh, move them. The government physically moved the homes of black families living in Yamato to the newly formed Newtown settlement in Delray Beach. Unlike the Sands and Frog Alley, where people segregated themselves according to their respective cultures, Newtown was a more cosmopolitan society. Newtown was kind of mixed because that didn't start uh, growing up until in later years when people start mixing more and more people were coming into Delray. So they mixed more and after a while they just... Uh, just, just mixed up all the way around, like it is now. The black families who lived at Yamato worked for the Japanese, who had established a colony of farmers in that section of Boca Raton shortly after the turn of the century. There was a town, a little street that was called Yamato. We used to call it Yamato. People today call it Yamato. You know, but but it, it was named because of this Japanese person, man, who owned a pineapple field and much of what uh, the productions here in that community was the growth of pineapple. The Yamato colony was a pioneering community of Japanese settlers that existed for a time in uh, what is now southern Palm Beach County. Uh, it was founded by a Japanese expatriate whose name was Joe Sakai, who came to South Florida initially in the uh, autumn of 1903 to investigate the possibility of uh, establishing one or more agricultural colonies of Japanese in the state of Florida. Uh, he came to Florida with uh, expectations that uh, uh, Florida business and political leaders would, uh, would welcome this kind of proposal um, because uh, that was what he had heard uh, prior to coming to the state. And indeed when he came, when he arrived, uh, he found that there was quite a bit of interest. Uh, he was immediately taken on a tour of the state to uh, to view sites uh, for and uh, to set up an initial colony. Many black families lived and worked in the Yamato colony as farm workers. Among the families that lived there and later displaced was the family of Noel yes, Penn. They, they pay for all of the uh, moving out from Yamato to Delray, and as a few families went to Deerfield, and the government paid for all of that. Some of them grumbled a little bit, but they couldn't help it. The property wouldn't belong to them. In fact, you, most back then, they used to call us squatters. They literally moved their houses for them to the areas in, in the surrounding areas of their choice. And a lot of them chose to come up here to Delray, so the government moved their houses in that area, west of 8th Avenue in Delray Beach. And that area back in the early 1940s was totally uninhabited. There were very few farms out there. That was called the Flatwoods. There were a lot of wild animals out there. But anyway, these people chose to live out there, so they had their homes built out there, and they, they developed, it, developed it. And that's why they called it Newtown. Here again, they had to have an address, so the Farrakhan live, lived in Newtown. By all accounts, the blacks and Japanese of the Yamato colony had a good relationship and mutual respect for each other. Uh, in, uh, among the materials that, uh, uh, that are available from the Yamato colony uh, itself uh, are, say, a diary from, uh, from Henry Kamiya. Uh, Henry Kamiya's diary uh, does talk about working with uh, uh, African Americans uh, in uh, various uh, various ways. Um, uh, some famous names uh, like Sistrunk uh, is a name that pops up in his diary. Um, during the terrible uh, hurricanes of the of the late 20s, the 1928 hurricane uh, uh, passed uh, the, the 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 southern wall of the eye passed over Yamato and um, did quite a bit of damage in the area. And uh, 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 he writes in his diary how his home, 
uh, uh, was or he used his home to shelter some of the uh, uh, the uh, black Americans who were living in the area. Black families lost their livelihoods on the farms of the Yamato colony, but very few complained. In fact, the Army Air Base greatly enhanced black communities and all of Delray Beach. Uh, it made it a whole lot better because while you was right in town, you can go where you want and buy a grocery. But from Yamato, we used to walk from Delray, I mean Yamato to Delray to buy a grocery. And as usual, the boys was the pack man. We had to carry all that back. And most of the people that had vehicles, they was all, you know, working on the farm or doing some other chores. So those who didn't have automobile had to walk and carry it. And there wasn't no such thing as taxis back then. The, the air base in Boca Raton did two things for Delray. It gave us an opportunity to uh, show our support for the military, our patriotism, and also provide land and home opportunities for those people who will be displaced. The citizens of the Sands, Frog Alley, and Newtown also extended their hospitality to black soldiers from the air base by establishing a USO in Delray Beach. But not only did that create a new town here in Delray, it generated a requirement from the social scale. And therefore, we established here in Delray a place called the USO. And from the USO became one of our old clubs called the Nasarima Club. And the Nasarima Club is America spelled backwards. But it, it was published and organized to support the airmen and the servicemen out of Boca Raton because at that time the black airmen could not attend the social activities on the base in Boca Raton. And so we established a USO here in the black community. And of course the Nasarima Club was a club that was organized to provide social activities for these young black uh, uh, airmen when they came to Delray Beach. The, the, the GIs and uh, a lot of them lived in Delray. Uh, a lot of the housing uh, that you see uh, along Swinton Avenue, I, there's several communities in the town. Uh, it impacted us pretty good because they were here and financially. That's why I, um, I sold newspapers down there, and I invited a lot of the guys up here. They, the USO um, was where the Delray Library is now. Um, that was where they all went and we just had a lot of people. Um, I was stock boy at the dime store during the war, and all of the clerks were wives of, or girlfriends of the, you know, the soldiers. So economically it really helped, and it sort of maybe have changed a little bit the lifestyle. The air base brought an economic boom to Delray Beach, as many people in the Sands, Frog Alley, Newtown, and the city at large now had a new source of employment. Yes, my dad worked at the air base, and that, that was one of the main sources of work in Delray, was working at, at Boca Raton Field there. And uh, that's where just about everybody worked. There wasn't a whole lot more that I remember. I remember the air base being, the beginning of the air base being built, and that providing a lot of work for people who are around to work. You know, a lot of uh, young fellows were, were glad for the work and actually doing the work. You know, Bill, I had an uncle who worked down there, and he, and his, he was a young man and uh, a little older than I. And uh, he would come back talking about the work that they were doing and the money that they were being paid for clearing and cleaning and building and whatever they hired them to do. Not only did the Air Base provide jobs, it, it provided other opportunities for education some training. And, and of course, even though World War II was a very devastating event in, in the history of America, it did a lot for not only the people here in Delray, but a lot of people throughout the United States. Young men got a chance to leave home or leave the farms or leave the fields. 
While many blacks enjoyed new livelihoods at the Army Air Base, some, even those who moved to Newtown, continued to farm. And some blacks even launched their own businesses, mostly in the vicinity of Northwest Fifth Avenue. This was the core of all of their activities. As a matter of fact, uh, when the first school was built, it was built on Fifth Avenue between Atlantic Avenue and First Street. The first theater was right across the street uh, from the, the first school. It was called the Old Case Theater. And it was owned by a white man, but it was operated by a black man. And his name was Carl Williams. Uh, but this was considered the inner city. And right here on the corner of, of Fifth, Fifth Avenue and First Street was a a grocery store called, and you used to call it Williams Corner because of that. And right across the street was the Masonic Lodge. And the Masons, who are a historical organization that go back many, many years, were the first to establish that building across the street. And there was a, also a little restaurant on First Street, uh, just east of Fifth Avenue, called Mansfield. There, it was a combination of, of a lunch counter, a soda counter. If you wanted medication, uh, those kinds of things, you could go into Mansfield. Back then, uh, make, dressmaking was uh, prevalent. You know, rather than uh, store-bought dresses, women made their dresses for women and children. But these were done in homes. They didn't have a, a dressmaking store, per se, but the, they made their dresses at home. Uh, there were grocery stores. There were not doctor's offices. In fact, there wasn't even a doctor's office for a long time on the other side, on, 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 from, from across the uh, east of Swinton Avenue for a long time. But there were a lot of midwives. In the late 1940s and throughout the 1950s, the LaFrance Hotel played host to the chauffeurs and maids of wealthy white vacationers. The LaFrance also occasionally hosted black musicians and entertainers who toured clubs in South Florida. Like Erskine Hawkins, Buddy Johnson, Clowns Carter, uh, Gene Brown, when, before he got up <laughs> very large, he was small then. And there was quite a few of them. Louis Jordan. Clarence Patrick's brother Charles built the LaFrance Hotel in 1949. The LaFrance was one of only a few African American owned and operated hotels in South Florida at the time. Charlie Patrick was the man who saw the need for this and he, he built it. And uh, I didn't realize this until recently that Charlie was a hard working man. He used to park cars over at uh, the hotels east of Delray. <laughs> he was over there working and doing, clean, doing their yards and parking cars and whatnot. And he had his own hotel over here. It was a place he, that uh, a lot of the waiters and people from up north, you know, who came during the winters, they, they lived there. And uh, people went there socially, uh, like cocktail hours and that kind of thing. But look, the French Hotel was mostly built for the, for the chauffeurs and things to come down on the beach and, and the waiters that, that work at uh, the place in Derry you call the tap room. Mm -hmm. They used to come down and wait tables and, and deliver at the, the French Hotel. And it was the only place that African Americans could stay when they were en route anywhere. If they needed a place to stay in this area, in the Boynton, Delray, Boca Raton area, the LaFrance Hotel was the only place they could, could live unless they live in private homes. The fact that blacks traveling through South Florida endured restricted lodging reflects the times of the Jim Crow South. Blacks were also subjected to other forms of discrimination based on race, including, for a brief period, beach restrictions. As Delray Beach boomed as a tourist destination in the 1950s and 60s, the beach became a key issue. 
northern white tourists were drawn to Delray's blue waters and white sand, but found those amenities less desirable when occupied by the town's black residents. Fearing an economic slide that a loss of visitors might bring, the town's mayor in 1962 proposed a beach plan that restricted blacks' use of the public beach. But such plan was short-lived as blacks fiercely rejected any beach restrictions based on their race. But longtime residents, both black and white, say the people of Delray Beach, for the most part, got along with each other much better than blacks and whites got along in most places in the South. For some reason, in South Florida on the East Coast, we didn't have as much prejudice and discrimination as like, like in um, um, Quincy, Florida, and Mariana, all up there, because um, we, we, it was a little different. It, it seemed to be that way, because I, I never had any, I mean, kids would get in fights, but you know, it, uh, as far as just enjoying life, and uh, I mean, they were at our house, and we were at their house, and, and they're just all over, the, you know, uh, blacks and whites, and I think the Chinese, Japanese, uh, uh, just a terrific, I and mean, we're Lebanese, and uh, just a, a great diversity within the community and, and they all enjoyed one another without thinking. Maybe there was something rich poor that was different because we couldn't do what they were doing and vice versa, but uh, overall I think everybody just seemed to get along. My granddad was walking on the beach one day in the, in the teens or the early twenties and he came upon a mahogany log and s several Afro-American children boys had were going to get the log and take it back out to the to the school and uh, some white fellows had came up come up and they were going to take the log from them and my granddad said no you let this let these kids have this log it belongs to them so they took it out to uh, the shop in the school and show their appreciation, they built my granddad a table out of that mahogany log. We did not have uh, the black-white confrontations that I've, I've heard other people speak about or that people who came to the area spoke about when they came here. We didn't have that. I don't know the reason. I guess we knew our place and we just stayed where we knew we would be safe or but anyway, we didn't have Ku Klux Klan, that sort of thing, to my knowledge. On April 4th, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was gunned down by an assassin. The murder of Dr. King heightened racial tensions throughout the country, including in Delray Beach. But residents say even then, unrest was mild compared to most American cities. Well, it was a frightening time for me, and there were a few skirmishes, uh, but no out-and-out -out, uh, battles or riots and whatnot. Yes, there was a lot of uh, talk. People were hurt. People were. Uh, well, I was afraid more than anything else because I thought we would have another civil war. In the 1960s, a few black families in the Sands, Frog Alley, and Newtown were still farming. But many more young people were going to college and seeking professional careers. By the end of the 60s, a younger generation was fostering a new culture in Delray Beach and almost everywhere else. Right, I think in 19, 1970 is when they got around to integrating the schools here in Delray Beach. And the white uh, kids and the black kids, uh, I guess, bought into each other's cultures. And I think that's when things started going downhill for all of us. 
The 1970s saw Delray's black-owned businesses on the decline and drug abuse and crime on the rise. Frog Alley, The Sands, and Newtown began experiencing a culture that was far removed from the values of the 30s, 40s, and 50s instilled by prominent black educators and civic leaders such as Solomon David Spady and the late C. Spencer Pompey. Many of the pioneers and early shapers of Delray's black sections are gone, but some residents remember the community father's influence, and they are willing to pass on their legacy. I spent 30 years in the Army. I had a wonderful career, and I found out that there were a lot of outstanding people in this world. But I, and I've been around the world two or three times. I've never been to a place that I enjoyed as much as Delray Beach. And when it became time for my retirement, I find it necessary to return home and give back to the community that had given so much for me. And that's why I'm here. The names Frog Alley, The Sands, and Newtown are no longer relevant in this modern society. But what is very relevant are the legacies the first settlers of those communities have left for all of us. If one is to truly benefit from what the city of Delray Beach has to offer, an effort to learn all of this city's great history would be time well spent. It is not just black history, it is American history. More specifically, it is a significant part of the history of Palm Beach County. That's our presentation. I'm William Giles. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break, break, break. So why we need to fall on our knees, lift our face toward the rising sun, and say, Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Can we just say it one more time? Oh, let us break breath on our knees. Please break bread together on our knees. Every once in a while, we need to fall on our knees, lift our face toward the rising sun, and say, oh Lord, have mercy on me, oh on me. Lord, oh Lord, break bread together on our knees, please let us break bread together on our knees, ain't no harm. To get together sometime and just break bread together on our knees. Oh, let us break bread together on our knees. Every once in a while, we need to fall on our knees, lift our face toward the rising sun, and say, Oh Lord, have mercy. So, oh,